All right, greetings and welcome. I'm not sure why Linda's video is not working, but she's here and we're gonna hear from her first. Thank you so much for your um, willingness to spend your time to come here and learn about this. Um, we're gonna start with Linda's experience with rhythmic movements and reflex integration. These are innate movements. Um, I call them neurodevelopmental movements. Um, but the most important thing about them is that they are innate and the brain re recognizes these movements, the brain, the body, and the sensory system. And Linda's going to share her experience about them. And then we'll have Melody also sharing her experience. And then I will give you a little bit of background info um, about why they're working and where you can learn more. All right, Linda, thanks so much for being here. And these are slides we prepared ahead of time uh, so that Linda could share with you some of what she's seeing as an OT um, using this work now for over four years. Okay, Linda, uh, you are on. Okay. So I've been an occupational therapist for about 24 years, and um, sensory processing is my most favorite thing to work with. And since I've learned the um, reflex integration and rhythmic movements, it has totally changed the outcomes that I'm seeing um, with the kiddos, especially in the area of self-regulation and handwriting. It used to be really challenging for me to really make the gains in handwriting, especially when I was working with students who were in, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth grade. And now with just doing some simple hand integration techniques that takes about one to two minutes, and the passive movements, which takes five minutes, I am helping kids experience success like I've never seen. Um, these movements have also really helped with just motor planning and body awareness and coordination. Oftentimes I'll have the kids warm up, you know, with wheelbarrow walking or the scooter board and for the children that have decreased proprioceptive awareness, um, usually they'll either slide off the scooter board or collapse with wheelbarrow walk. And so I'll just um, do a few of the passive rhythmic movements that are part of this program. And, you know, about seven to eight times out of 10, the kids can then stay planted on the scooter board for, you know, prone propulsion and wheelbarrow walk. So it's pretty incredible. Okay. So you guys should be able to see Linda's slides. I'm gonna show you her beautiful face here. <laughs> this is who is actually talking. So I'm going to take myself off the camera and um, I'm not sure why we're not getting your video feed, Linda. But anyway, here you are and I'm trusting that you guys can see the um, slides now. Okay, so I think we're on track. So Linda, you were saying, and so it's just amazing to me that something that does not require expensive specialized equipment or a swing if you're in a place that doesn't have it can work so effectively for motor planning and body awareness and just that, you know, core stability. So um, go ahead and talk about this boy here, um, Linda. I'm assuming you can see the slides, correct? Yes. yes. So this is pretty incredible because I never worked with this child. His mom is a PT that I worked with, you know, a few years ago. And one morning she came into my office in well, my treatment room and she was in tears because her little boy was he wasn't able to read and he was having a lot of difficulty with writing and attention. So this was in August and I had just gone to the three day, you know, rhythmic movement course in February. So I was able to show this mom and my PT friend some of the passive movements that she could implement with her son. So she went home and she did that. In the first entry, I'm looking at the picture of it, it's like 82613. So it was at the beginning of a school year. And then the fourth entry where you see, you know, there's still a lot of challenges, but it's much better. That was 82913. And all she was doing was, you know, about five minutes of the passive rhythmic movements that are part of this program at night and in the morning before school. And then this, I believe this sample was from 913. So just, you know, within just two to three weeks. And typically, you just don't see that type of improvement. Well, I haven't, you know, with just a very passive technique that doesn't require special equipment. Right. And so this was interesting, Linda, because this one, you just had given them the passive rhythmic movements to do. 
and you haven't even started on the hand reflexes. Right. That is correct. And I wish I would have known them then because we would have seen even better improvements. It's just amazing to me with that, with just the simple one to two minutes of the hand reflexes for line placement, um, pencil pressure, and anyway, it's incredible, and letter size. Yes. And then um, tell us about what happened with his oral reading fluency. Okay, so I had forgotten those stats, um, but I believe it was, it was, yes, right here, it's on the slide. So he went with just, you know, two weeks from 22 words per minute to 82 words per minute because the teachers, you know, they'll do that little reading fluency drill. And it was, he didn't have anything but those passive rhythmic movements twice a day for five minutes, and he improved his reading fluency 60 words per minute. His teacher was astounded. Yeah, it, we've seen some huge jumps. And I tell, um, tell the listeners, Linda, about your thing about how um, you told me a story about one little boy who had been trying for weeks to um, pedal a stationary yeah. bike, um, and then um, you did the rhythmic movements, the passive rhythmic movements with him for about five minutes, and then um, he hopped on back on and he could pedal. Um, so I love how you do that with a lot of the kids. You like they you're doing some kind of functional skill and then you break and do the rhythmic movements and then you go back to the skill. Yes. Yeah, so the little boy that um, you're referring to, he's so sweet. He's probably in third grade now. This was when he was three, about th three and a half. And he had been trying to pedal this bike, but his feet kept sliding off the pedals. He just couldn't propel him forward. So we you know, we stopped, got off the little bike, did, a, you know, about probably about five minutes of the passive rhythmic movements, got him back on the bike, and he rode all the way down the hall and around the corner without his feet sliding off the pedals. You know, it's just amazing how, like, with some kids, you'll see just that drastic improvement in the moment. You know, there there is one question here about is there success with children with autism? Do you want to speak to that? Yes, um, gr great success with children with autism. You know, a lot of the children that I see that have a diagnosis of autism, you have to, I start really, really slow. You know, those, um, some of them have more difficulty tolerating the movements. And so I just start with just brief periods, you know, maybe two to three to four to five seconds of each movement. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there are some children with that diagnosis where they'll lay there and that's the most quiet and still and calm that I ever see them. Um, there was one little boy, it was so interesting. He was four and he was new to our preschool and he was giving the teachers a really hard time at nap because he just could not go to sleep and he would disrupt the other children. So um, I showed the teacher one of the rhythmic movements, you know, the rocking on the back. And that was the first time he ever slept. And, you know, he needed his rest, but he was one that was different than a lot of the kids. He tolerated a lot of them and it just helped him get the rest he needed and he always responded but but generally with the children i see who have autism you know they tolerate less and so i start less and then you know build upon that and and just make sure they're comfortable i don't i don't force anything because you know this is the less is more model right right okay so um so it looks like ones want to know what these movements are that we're talking about. They're all innate movements. They're based on what children do, infants do actually, from the womb and really early infancy. So the rhythmic movements that we're talking about are movements that babies do as long as they're healthy, as long as they have room to move as long as they're not stressed. And babies will do them naturally. It's part of our innate uh, human um, intelligence that we have, that we come with a set of movements. So the primitive reflexes, which you all already know about, um, or most of you, um, I, I know the therapists know about that. And then the rhythmic movements are another set of innate movements that actually support calming the body, maturing the brain, body, and sensory system, and they support the reflex integration. So basically what we're doing here, I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead to this slide since we're getting questions about this. So 
we are doing neurodevelopmental movement with these children. And the reason is, is we are replacing what was not done in infancy for the most part. There are um, situations where there's been trauma and then um, our primitive reflexes um, reactivate. But for the most part, most of the children in, who are having challenges and the types of challenges that they're having um, are related to, in part, not all the way, but in part, they're related to the fact that they've never really fully developed the brain, body, and sensory system from the very beginning, like starting in the womb. And so these dysfunctions happen early on, and that's why this picture is here to show you. Um, and so, so basically what we're doing is we are taking movements that should have been done naturally and normally in a healthy infant and applying those movements. And uh, like I said, the brain recognizes them. It like soaks them up like food and then de develops. So just a little bit more about this slide is that you all can see which children have proper alignment they're able to be upright, free of tension. It's very clear. You can see the alignment, the uprightness, they're also more alert. They're able to interact with their environment more. And then obviously the children on the bottom, um, and th those are actual pictures. The faces have been changed in Photoshop, but the bodies are exactly how they are. Um, how, how they actually were. And this is what is happening with children because they're not getting what they need right from the get-go. And so um, this is why when we give the movements that they should have gotten, and they're not, they're not um, a big secret or anything, they're not something, it's just replicating development, which is why they work. So because development works, that's why when we give these movements, they work. Um, even if we do it at a later age. Um, okay, the, the slide is a little bit blurry, so um, you know I trust that maybe people can make something out of it. But this is a slide of a boy. Um, he was diagnosed with dysgraphia, and he came to me when he was in fourth grade. So the slide on the left is his initial evaluation when he was in fourth grade, and the slide on the right is a, is about a year later when he was in fifth grade, and so he actually improved his rate of handwriting from 33.8 letters per minute to 51.2 letters per minute. So he improved to grade level. And the initial slide, he omitted, you know, several middle letters of the words. He would omit words at the beginning and end of lines, and he would um, hold his head really close to the paper. And then on the the, the post-test, the reevaluation a year later, he only omitted one letter. And, you know, his the letter size is more consistent for his age. You know, there's still some trouble there, but he does have a diagnosis of dysgraphia. But I just thought it was incredible because this is a fourth grade boy. Now he's in fifth grade. And typically, well, my experience in the past is usually when they hit this grade in their boys, it's really, really challenging in their, and in the, and, it's, and so sometimes they can be unmotivated for it. But with these techniques, he stayed motivated. He saw differences. There were improvements at school. And he improved his rate of handwriting, you know, to grade level from the low grade level. So I just think it's, it's incredible. Right. And that, that is really important that um, the kids, they can feel these movements working and they do stay motivated, which is wonderful. And they're often very proud of themselves. So then just going back to this slide here, you talked about um, with reflex integration, the accommodations aren't necessary. And you were talking about highlighters and things like that. Maybe talk a little bit more about what you were doing in the past that now you don't have to do. <laughs> Yeah, so in the past, in order to help with line placement and letter size, I would have to use a highlighter, you know, and now it's like it just becomes automatic for them. So I don't need the highlighters to show them where the line is or, or to show them how to, you know, what size to make a lowercase letter and an uppercase letter. You know, it's just more automatic for line placement and letter size and especially, you know, with pencil pressure. 
Great. Okay, super. And then going back to, um, let's just, uh, I want to go back to this slide here, because um, in another interview I did with you, Linda, you had said that um, the rhythmic movements and reflex integration are by far the most effective tool you've used for sensory integration. And then, um, so you can talk about that if you like, and then um, the emotional regulation piece. Yes. So, so with these tools, you know, these movements, the children, you know, who, who struggle and they have dyspraxia or challenges, they are much more emotionally regulated in a session where they're able to be challenged and not fall apart. Um, this is the first thing I've been able to offer parents where they can do at home that actually helps some of these kids sleep. And I love it because it doesn't require special equipment or expensive equipment and it's and the program is just so easily implemented at home. And so I'm seeing significant improvements in sensory integration without special equipment required. And and, and so much easier to train parents on. Yes. But, you know, with some of the other things, sometimes you get the kids too high. You know, they do fine in sessions, but then at home when the parents, you know, follow the sensory diet, the kids may, their arousal may increase and it may be difficult for the parent to bring it back down. Whereas, you know, therapists, we kind of just do it automatically. But with this, you know, the kids get less overstimulated. It's just a much more regulated program that can be implemented in the classroom, at home, and you just see the gains. Very good. All right, wonderful. So um, I wanted to just answer one question. First of all, I just want to say, Linda, thank you so much for sharing your experience Linda is volunteering her time to be with us, and I really appreciate it, and so is Melody. Um, and I just wanted to say one thing, because um, there was a question that I do want to address, and it was about whether or not um, there needs to be parent carryover, or can this be done once a week? Um, ideally, there is parent carryover. Ideally, it's done daily or close to daily, um, but... We do see OTs uh, who have great results with the children, even with um, even with uh, just 30 minutes a week. Um, it takes longer, and uh, it's not as effective, but it's still life-changing for the children, and um, very. Um, you know, it's just very important to provide them with these movements because they really are the foundation for function. Um, okay, so Linda, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate all your comments and your dedication to learning and applying this work. It's wonderful. All right, so um, I wanna see uh, if Melody's there. Melody, can you hear us? Can you say hi? <laughs> hi, everybody. I'm super honored that you've taken the time to talk with us about these tools. Um, they're so important, and it's important that ones understand how they're being used and that uh, the kind of results that we're seeing. So the first thing is, is can you share um, your background? How good about yourself? Well, I went to physical therapy school at Pacific University when dinosaurs were still on the earth. <laughs> Let's see. I've been practicing 37 years, and for all of it except for those years, I've done pediatrics. And um, still doing pediatrics, plan to do it for another decade or so. And I love it. And um, if I only had one tool in my therapy toolbox, it would be the reflex integration stuff. It has been the most valuable thing I've ever learned in my entire career. So you've been at this for a long time, and um, you're and saying that, floor. and you can still get off the floor. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, movement is so key to our well-being. But um, and, and one thing about these rhythmic movements and reflexes is that they are what we are designed with to develop in the first place. And I think that's the main reason why they work so well, but you're gonna tell us how they're working for you. Cause that's a big thing to say, wow, I have all these tools and if I could only pick one, I would pick these uh, reflex integration tools. Uh, so reflexes and uh, the rhythmic movements are um, also reflex integration tools. So tell us more 
Um, let me just go to this first slide. So um, you have a whole case study written up about this young uh, child here. Um, tell us about what happened in this case. So Tate came to me after he had already received nine months of physical therapy. And um, he was 13 months old. And usually at that age, don't see a ton of progress because they're already walking around. It's hard to get them to stabilize that shoulder girdle with their hands on the floor and that kind of stuff. So I wasn't real optimistic with this guy. He had um, a left lean that at best was 30 degrees and a right rotation, just real straightforward toward a collar with um, the right rear head flattened from that position. And um, happened to be taking your second level brain and sensory foundation course and learn some new things. I was absolutely, utterly amazed that just in uh, two months, that almost complete resolution of that total policy, and he's still doing good now. I checked with his mom yesterday just to make sure all was well, and it is, and it was because of the, the um, using those reflexes so the body automatically wants that head in midline and automatically wants those arms working. So he had some shoulder limitations where he could only lift his arms to about 130 degrees out of the expected 180, just from all of that tight musculature that goes along the torticollis in that neck and shoulder area. And so that was just amazing to me to get resolution so quickly on a child that old for the diagnosis of torticollis. Just right, right. Well, that's, that is amazing. And um, it points to the fact that these are innate movements. And it seems to me from doing this a long time that the brain and the body really take these movements um, and can utilize them. So just a little bit more about um, this young man here. Um, you said you were taking the second level brain and sensory foundations course and what specifically from that course did you use and then we'll go on to your next case study well the <clears throat> excuse me um the parachute reaction reflex had a profound effect on him as well as the facial oral reflex integration um movement that was something that was new to my repertoire and they were just amazing in helping to resolve the protocolist. And his family was kind of an average family for using the reflexes. They weren't like just doing tons of them. So I feel like he's a very representative case of what can be done when you have these tools in your tool bags. Not like he was getting somebody was working with eight hours a day or anything like that. They were just kind of doing it two or three times a day for a few minutes and his automatic underlying hardwired reflexes just kicked into action and helped his body function the way it was supposed to. Fabulous. So I just want to make clear for those who are listening because my slide is um, not very detailed, but this little boy was 13 months old. And you said his torticollis was resolved in two months. So I just want to make sure everybody got that. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Melody. Um, it's wonderful. Okay. And then for teaching. Thank you for uh, teaching me those tools because I have 12 torticollis cases on my caseload right now. And it's just amazing how much resolution we can get just tapping into that body's innate hardwire reflex system. It's just wonderful. Good, and I'm so glad, because that's a really good point, that it, this is not just a special case. Like, these movements are uh, critical for all of us, really, for our development. And I think w one of the things I just am amazed about is that when we don't receive them when we're infants, or if there's a case like an injury with torticollis or something like that that gets in the way of our development, we can use them later on, way past the age of infancy, and they still provide tremendous uh, support and integration.
So anyway, well, thank you, Melody, and tell us about this young man. So this was a, must be a five-year-old, right? A kindergartner? Yes. He was five years old, and, and this is such a typical child that um, you see, you know, they, they don't have any diagnosis of, you know, like cerebral palsy or missing limb or anything like that. They get to kindergarten, and they're just not thriving on the playground. This little guy was kind of scared to be out there with the other kids, and it's just because he physically was quite uncoordinated. And so he came to me, and we started some of the basic, the passive rhythmic movements. This was um, four years ago. Didn't have the tools that I have now, but had some of those basic one and his family was really good about doing them five nights a week for like 10 to 15 minutes and um, in six months he on the peabody developmental motor skills he went from a negative 2.6 standard deviation below the mean to negative 0.41 that is just unheard of in his age equivalency the first time i tested him was 22 to 28 months, depending on which subtest you look at, and it jumped clear up to 52 to 71 months. So there's three subtests in this growth motor one, and so they were in that range. And I noticed on your um, slide there, um, Sonia, that his age equivalency increased much more than six months. Okay, he gave, let's, <laughs> let's get this right here. You know what, I'm going to put this up on the screen. It's okay. So in six months, okay, so yeah, 30 months, in 30 months, six months. Okay, so in six months, he gained, um, he gained 30. Yeah. And he also learned how to ride a bike. He was, he couldn't even ride a trike when I saw him. And he learned how to ride a bicycle. It, it just was amazing to me when you just settle down that the fear reactions and that how the body can just blossom. Because when these kids are, the moral reaction is common of the fear paralysis response um, is active. They just don't develop right. They're always in that flight or flight mode. And I see this type of child a lot and I think they're overlooked a lot and become behaviors in school when actually the reflexes are just creating a problem for them and with some attention it can be turned around quickly it can just change their lives so dramatically and it doesn't really take that long it's just an amazing shift for them and I see these kids more and more the words kind of getting out you know that they'll have those reflexes tested and see if there's something simple we can do for them and um, it just changes children's lives and I think these children so often fall through the cracks because they're you know they're cognitively intact they don't have a physical diagnosis it's just not quite right and um, I'm so thankful to have this tool in my toolbox to help these kids thrive All right so let's talk about, so this is a more typical child who um, is just kind of struggling, but there's nothing huge going on. But here you have a case study where there's um, this little girl has severe uh, cerebral palsy. Can you talk about this? Yes. This is the first child that I really applied it to that was severely involved. And... Um, she was six years old when we started this, and I had already been seeing her for a year prior to that, and she still did not have head control. She could, when you were holding her and sitting, she would try and get her head upright, but was not able to. She was not able to get it upright and hold it there. And so her mom um, was really willing to give this a great shot. And we just basically did the six paths of rhythmic movement that kind of come with level one. And she did them um, um, six nights a week. And in one year, it was just amazing. She was able not only to hold her head upright, 
but she was able to sit in ring ring sitting where their legs are um, not straight ahead of them, but kind of in a circle in front of them. Mm-hmm. And she was propping on her hands, and she could hold her head up for five seconds while looking around the room. That is so huge to make that big of a jump, right? In one year that had not been able to be um, elicited in the years prior to that foot therapy that she had had. She could also side sit, which is pretty phenomenal because the, the trunk is very asymmetrical in a side sit. It's hard to keep your head upright if you have forehead control. And she could do that as well. And um, the AT&R, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, which was just so dominant in the posture before we started this, started to integrate. And she could get her hand to her mouth. And she was so excited to suck her thumb for the first time. And she could get... Um, we would put food on her hands, you know, like a peanut butter or something like that. And she would have so much fun sucking that off of there. And she could get told in her mouth. It really increased the quality of her life. And she has definitely improved since then. But I was so amazed. It really made me a believer way back in 2012. This actually occurred because I took your class in December of 2011, if I'm remembering correctly. Right. So... These reflexes work across this continuum of the severely involved child to those who are basically typical and just struggling a little bit to kids who were normal and fell out of the tree and broke their arm and now their fear reflexes are active. And it's just amazing how it works on so many. It, it is the best tool in my toolbox, no doubt about it. Okay, that was Melody. Thank you so much, Melody. Um, I know Melody is actually here with us. What you just saw was pre-recorded. And, um, but she is here with us, but for some reason we cannot, I, I, we don't know if it's uh, because of the internet um, connection, but we cannot um, get her uh, voice to show up right now. But what we're going to do is I'm going to um, share my screen one more time. Okay, so I'm trusting that you can um, see my screen now, and you're going to see the green slides again. So um, I got into this work because I read a book called Smart Moves, Why Learning is Not All in Your Head. I started to do the movements. I felt a tremendous um, change in my own um, functioning, and I um, I was in a position where I was able to take many, many courses over several years. I just took one course after another, after another. Um, My background is I uh, have studied uh, biology and psychology. I had a combined major in college. And when I learned about these reflexes and I felt them working in my own body, I thought, wow, if I had known these back at the time I was going to school, I could have done that all that work in with half the effort. So I definitely felt a profound, tremendous uh, relief um, doing this work personally for myself. I was able to let go of very deep subconscious over um, like overwhelm, a sense of overwhelm and anxiety that was very buried. Um, And I really had had it all my life. And I didn't really know anything different until I did these movements. And then I was able to um, heal from that condition and really experience life in a much more joyful, spontaneous, balanced, uh, positive way. So that was my experience. I started using it with my children. I was utterly fascinated. And I was in a position at that time because my husband was, uh, he was, um, Uh, in a transition. So he wasn't working. So he stayed home with our two children, which we were homeschooling. And I was able to go out and learn so much. And I've never been so fascinated in my life. Um, And I still continue to be fascinated with how well these movements work. So um, I'm going to show you a drawing. This is Kyle. Um, He's five years old. This is his first drawing. I know we're running uh, short on time, so I'm just going to show you. Here's the second drawing. I usually like to ask people what they would guess how much time was spent um, 
between these two drawings and it was literally uh, 10 minutes of rhythmic movement done in between the two drawings. I'll let you see the first one here first. That's the first one and that's the second one. His mother is a physical therapist and she shared these with me um, in a course that I was teaching. Um, I already showed you this slide and explained it. Um, here's another slide that gives you an idea. So obviously the child, you guys know this on the left, is um, healthy and has been um, exposed to the proper neurodevelopmental movement so that we um, have the core strength that's supposed to be there. Um, and the baby there in that drawing, the photo above um, from Kathleen Porter, uh, that is showing less development, obviously, and less core strength. And then those compensations are carried through. So um, one of my first mentors was Dr. Blomberg, and his course was about these movements and how they could help with uh, overcoming the ADHD symptoms. Um, so basically, you guys already know that re reflexes are uh, soft signs and they interfere with our neurosensory motor function. And I'm just going to um, share with you that there are wide applications for this, um, not only uh, for functional tasks and motor coordination as far as physical tasks, but also cognitively, emotionally, um, social, emotional, and we often see much better sleep and much better um, speech. The, this is really the completion of what I wanted to share, except that um, if you guys do want to learn more, up and from now up until October 31st, you, there we have open enrollment for the Brain and Sensory Foundations course. And there is a, uh, a discount code, which I just typed in the chat box. It's 39 GIFT. So it's the number three, the number nine, and then in all caps, the word GIFT, G-I-F-T. And that will take $39 off the tuition fee.